Uh, Bill, again, I think you did an excellent job in uh, the uh, second lecture uh, and uh, bringing up several points, but I do have some things that I've, uh, that I've questioned. Uh, and I think it's important for us, and I, you agreed with me, that it was important for us to also, uh, as it were, revisit uh, the idea of whether, uh, whether this book has any meaning now. Uh, I've got my first shot uh, well before this uh, video becomes available to everybody. I'll have my second. You've had both your first and the second. Jim, you're in line to get your I'm first. I'm signed up. Uh, I hear that 11% uh, of the population is now inoculated. Uh, I also saw that one of the local hospitals is now inviting people who are 18 years uh, or uh, older to come and get their vaccine. <clears throat> uh, we're well on the way to having a vaccine for uh, children six months or above. Uh, by the time this gets out, uh, COVID may not be a problem at all. And so have we missed the opportunity? Should we have published this uh, six months ago when we were in the heights of it? Oh, it would have been nice to have been able to do it <laughs> at that time. Uh, I've thought about that, and um, I, I think we're not, as, we're not as close as we think we are to the end. You're talking about 11%, so that's a high percentage. Of, that haven't been. That haven't been, and we have on the horizon, we keep hearing the scary stories about more possibilities. But beyond that, I think the reason that the booklet and then the, the videos themselves become important is because we're talking about a bigger subject. Mm -hmm. We're talking about how do you live with suffering? How do you live in times of stress? Uh, by this, what we're calling the kingdom of living. Okay. How, do we, how do we live as Christian people when we're having all this conflict and all this uh, distress? in our lives. And I think that becomes the big overall importance. Uh, we can always use this as just the subject that we're talking out of. Sure. But I, I believe that that makes it important. What do you, what do you think, Jim? I, I agree with you. I, I think that, uh, you know, the title of our, of, of these lessons are Kingdom Living in the Time of COVID-19 Pandemic. And we could easily substitute Kingdom Living in the in the time of a natural disaster. Kingdom living in- 21st in, in, century, right? Yeah, <laughs> kingdom living in, in the time of a, a family tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, things are gonna happen to us after, like you said, after this cools down yeah. and it is just something in the past, there will be other things. So, so hopefully I, we get so some- So I, I think this is very yeah. relevant. And, and hopefully we'll get some of the principles and ideas that can really help undergird our experiences and our living. Right. And, right. To, and to be very honest, um, there are lots of times in my life when I have scratched my head and wondered where God was. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I uh, didn't understand whether to go to the left or the right. And, you know, the psalmist said the small voice, uh, but there are times when there are no voices. There are times when God doesn't speak, and uh, it is so still and so small yeah. that I can't find mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah, and it mm -hmm. makes it hard. And so, how do you live in a time of uncertainty or yes. of loss uh, <clears throat> or of tragedy of any kind? Yes. And quite frankly, I wish this were the first time that the church had faced um, pandemics. But it's not, no, and no. Uh, it won't be the last. Be the last. And if it's not uh, Corona, it'll be something else. It'll be something else. Uh, and again, the whole idea of the book, from my perspective, is uh, how do you live in a time of uncertainty, in a time when God's voice isn't clear? So, yes. Yes. so I I agree with you. Uh, I think maybe we should uh, take the word COVID out and just say uh, kingdom living in a time of fill in the blank right. here. Okay. Yes. I think right. with a booklet we can do that on the video. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay. Um, several times, or, or at least once within the uh, within the lecture, Bill, you talked about uh, uh, a time of a loss of innocence. You and you talked about the COVID virus as being a loss of of innocence. Uh, you also talked about the Vietnam War. And some of our people that are listening to it are not going to be old enough to know it except as a historical event, right. but, but we all lived through it. So, uh, Bill, what do you mean a loss of innocence? Well, when I, when I was uh, working on this lecture that we did, uh, one of the things I said that this, uh, it's an event that interrupted America's myth of innocence 50 years before uh, George Floyd's death interrupted it again. And uh, when, I re when I wrote that, I was thinking about um, the times we've had when we've talked about uh, loss of innocence. And it's really a myth because um, uh, our present time and our political and social situations, uh, uh, this word innocent, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to share my thoughts, I guess, about that so-called American innocence. And uh, we, all of us grew up with this myth. We went to the movies and we watched uh, John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart. Uh, they, everything they did was okay yeah. to save lives. Yeah. At the same time, uh, the French and the uh, Germans and the Japanese and the Russians were cynical. They were uh, villainous. They were cruel. They were devious. But Americans were always uh, wholesome and upstanding. Mm. Now, I'm as patriotic as any person I know. Uh, but reality doesn't give us that if you look at history, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking of times uh, uh, in the past, uh, the Abu Harub, or however you pronounce that, uh, several years ago was widely distributed as the end of, of American innocence. And this was the Hussein had the people in prisons in his area there, and there were 50,000 Americans mm -hmm. uh, uh, or 50,000 men, women, and children being punished and tortured and so on and so forth. Um, and so that phrase was used. And then we used the phrase again uh, during the uh, massacre in My Lai, or My Lai. Uh, in Vietnam. In Vietnam. And then in Oklahoma City, uh, we, we used it again. And then in 9-11, <laughs> we used it again. But in those cases, often what it meant was that America could no longer consider itself immune to terrorism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's a good example of looking at those because when they were globally distributed, and they haven't always been, some of them we did, people, you know, I mentioned those names, people say, well, when was that? Yeah. Or what was that? Yeah. But the factor that changes um, our recent experience uh, with George Floyd was that this was seen internationally yeah. mm -hmm. by everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And part of that reason was that we were dealing with the virus so we were all home watching television. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was seen. And so uh, to hold that kind of view uh, is not feasible uh, anymore. It, it makes uh, uh, this pretense of innocence uh, and killing people by by police or whoever, uh, not an innocent act anymore. Yeah, um, and it just brings us again to our. That's so. How does this apply to the the virus? I think it applies to the virus is because we think somehow we're going we were going to be immune from this. Mm. So we blamed it on other countries. We blamed it wherever we could blame it. Yeah, simply because it certainly has nothing to do with us. Yeah, but we found out very quickly. It had a lot to do with all of us, and the world over. Right. And even, even, you know, I thought, even if it did get to our shores, our medical uh, fraternity and, and all of the hospitals would, would see it coming well ahead of time and be prepared, and that the uh, scientists would have the needles ready to go into the arms, and uh, yes, maybe we'd have a couple of thousand people across the nation who would die, but, but we would be on top of it. I really did think we would be on top of it. Mm -hmm. But in fact, 
now it's more than half a million people that have died yes, uh, yes. because of it yes uh, and religious people too uh there were jim you were telling us about one that yeah, you saw on I tv I, I'm, we were talking earlier about a church, I, I believe it was in North Carolina, mm -hmm. where last year, early on, when they were talking about, you know, you have to be careful, social distancing, uh, and they were warning about large groups. Yeah. This minister said, God will protect us. God will protect us. Uh, it wasn't very long after he made that statement that he came down with the virus and died. Yeah. Uh, myth of innocence. And so, yeah, again, yes. what... Yes. We thought that God would put a shield around us and, and that we would be immune and, and vulnerable either because of science or because of religion or because of something else. Good luck. That we were different. Yes. Yeah. That uh, it may be the, the Chinese would die, it may be the Ita Italians would die. Would die. Bill, in, in the first uh, uh, lecture, you talked about the quote, uh, they came for the Jews, but I wasn't a Jew, and I, so I didn't care. And they came for the gypsies, and uh, I wasn't a gypsy, so I didn't care. They came for the homosexuals. I wasn't a homosexual, so I didn't care. When they came for me, there was nobody there to care. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, I think uh, we need to be very careful when we say, God will do this or have this. Uh, I had, uh, you know, the, to, to bring up uh, an illustration, I know that people have talked about the wall mm -hmm. sometime, the yeah. wall on the south. But people thought that they had created a wall yeah. around their life, yeah. either technology yeah. or religion, yeah. that that wall would protect them, yeah. would protect them from the virus. And... Sadly, many were proven yeah. and, wrong. And now we find out that the wall did not work. Right, exactly. And um, I had a, uh, heard a, uh, a Jewish scholar talking about the Ten Commandments uh, who said uh, that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain is n not just talking about profanity but it's also attributing to God something that God himself uh, didn't do, didn't say, mm. uh, and therefore taking the name of God in vain and thinking that we can control God um, by assuming what he will do. That's interesting. Well, I think what you're saying, the idea of wall, I always think of the Ten Commandments as kind of the fence mm. that you're not supposed to get past this fence. Mm-hmm. If you do that, you violate it. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus comes along and says, you don't need to get out there at all. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You change your, change <laughs> the way you look at the world. Yeah. You, you don't need to get out and cross. The, worry about crossing that fence. Yes. You're yeah. not, you know, not going to kill somebody. You're not even going to hate them. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's an interesting concept, I think, of how we think we're going to protect ourselves. So, in fact, uh, the... The myth of the loss of innocence is what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, not the loss of innocence, although we innocently believe certain things that weren't true. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm also interested, Bill, in the Bergman quote that uh, you had in the lecture. The Bergman quote said, The virus is God's way of telling us that the naive, uh, naivete of globalism and its concert that we may master and use the resources of the earth in our uh, indifferent indulgences will fail. It means that God will not be mocked. Uh, this seems to be saying uh, that Bergman believes that the virus is because we have used God's resources in an inappropriate way. Interesting, because Bergman's also trying to say we cannot go to the scriptures and, and uh, uh, say this is what, this, what, how do you say that? There's no ready transfer mm. of those narratives to real life crisis. Mm -hmm. So he's saying be careful on what you say it means from Old Testament to today. 
But I think what he's he's looking at is he's trying to take a God principle mm -hmm. that is God made the earth and said it was good and says when we violate God's uh, premise mm -hmm. of how we should live and he made this world for us to live in and we violate that, there will be consequences to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where he's going, as I understand him, at least in, in reading that. Um, you can notice, I think, all the time that in both in Old Testament and New Testament, the present suffering of the world, and they knew as much about that or more than we do, yeah. uh, never makes them falter in their claim that the created world really is um, uh, a good creation mm -hmm. uh, of a good God. Mm. Uh, my um, family, uh, my mother was uh, Native American, she was Cherokee, so though I look, my dad's Irish, uh, I have a great deal of uh, uh, Cherokee blood. But one of our concerns always was the earth. My mother, would go, we'd go out to, to, to get plants in the woods, and my mother would always say, you must leave one, or you must leave two. She would make sure you never took everything um, because you protected it, you, mm -hmm. you preserved it, and so forth. And so she was very careful about how she treated the earth. And I learned uh, to, to appreciate that. And then when I did work with the Navajos later in life and so forth, I began to appreciate the Native American concerned about the earth and being a part of it and taking care of it. Um, and God did tell Adam to be a steward of the earth. Yes, yes. So and in fact, someone says, if you take away the goodness of creation, uh, then you have left judgment where the world is just thrown away. Mm. Uh, and we don't want to throw the world away. That's true. Uh, for many, many reasons, we can go into that more religiously, but yeah. uh, I think it's an important thing. I, in fact, uh, we were talking about this with uh, Easter's coming, coming soon, and Easter's the beginning of, of uh, God's new creation. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of, say, John 20 and 21 is that we who believe in, in Jesus uh, are to become, in the power of the Spirit, not only the beneficiaries of a new creation, but we're to be new agents of the creation. Mm -hmm. So I think it behooves us as Christian people to be very concerned about how we take care and become uh, caretakers of the earth in which we live. Uh, Jen, what do you think? Well, I, I like that word, Stuart. And I like the word caretaker. Mm -hmm. There are so many cases of illnesses that can be traced back to pollution, mm. whether it's in the air or it's in the water. And, we, and people get sick because of the, the way that they ignore the environment, the, the way they pollute the environment. Yes. And then it comes back. It comes back to, to harm us. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That, uh, that being said... The whole point is that we should be careful to, about jumping to conclusions. Yes, yeah. yes. And that we should uh, be very careful. We can say, this may be what God is doing, or this may be what God is saying, or this mm -hmm. may be the cause, uh, but we better be very, very careful when we say, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. We, should, we should say about Brigham that he talks a lot about using imagination. I mean, yeah. He doesn't mean imagination making up stuff. Uh -huh. He means you need to read with an imaginative mind what God's meaning for you to do this. Mm. And so I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about be imaginative in how to take care of the earth and, and following God's will. You don't always have a thus saith the Lord, mm. but you certainly have an imagination to see what, he, what you imagine that he's trying to say to us. Mm -hmm. And that that's a legitimate way to look at things. A legitimate way, as long as we are careful. Absolutely. As long Absolutely. as we are Job, Job's friends yeah. made that mistake of jumping to the conclusion yeah. of, of telling Job, this is why all this is happening to you. They had no idea. Right. They had no idea. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's very interesting that the book of Job was written to counteract a socially accepted... Uh, fundamental principle that if you do right then you will be healthy wealthy and wise yes. Uh, yes. and if 
you're not healthy, wealthy, and wise, it must be because you or somebody else did wrong. Yes. In N.T. Wright, in his book, gave that, I think it's a beautiful illustration about the vending machine. Mm. That he says, you know, people think it's like a vending machine. That you see in... Yes. And you put that in the machine, and out comes a punishment. Yeah. You know, it's, that, that's the way I think some people see that. Yes. That, that something bad happens to you, it's because of something that you've done. Or maybe a group of people. That, uh, you know, uh, an earthquake hits a, hits a country. Well, it's because those people, what they did years ago. And there's some direct reason, yes. some direct yeah. link. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I have to tell you this story out of my own ministry. And there was a lady uh, who was very influential in the latest group of a church that I ministered to uh, that taught in the group that if you had a sore on your hand, it was because you had done something sinful with your hand. <laughs> if you had a sore on your foot, it was because you had gone someplace that you shouldn't have gone. <clears throat> and one Sunday I came in and she was sitting down front and I noticed that the ladies would go up to her and they'd come away just covering their mouth. And so I couldn't figure out what was going on. And so I went up and said hello to her and she said, I'm sorry, I can't talk today. <laughs> God had taken away her voice. <laughs> so... I agree with you that it isn't always true, but sometimes. <laughs> I've had many, oh, yes. many a problem yes. with my stomach that I knew the reason for it was to indulging in something I shouldn't have indulged. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, while my uh, heredity may have something to do with my big belly, <laughs> it's probably the food that I, too much food that I push, push into it. So maybe the lesson is we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. But, uh, um, Bill, a big part of the video you spent talking about lament. Yes. Uh, and one of the points that you made was that the uh, church has, I think you called it, is lament light. Yes. Uh, and your point, uh, point was that the church had basically lost lament. Uh, I think... Uh, I think I really agree with you that we don't have much room for lament in our services. Um, it, it, I may be wrong, but my personal experience with worship is that uh, worship at first was very mystical. Uh, and uh, we had uh, candles and dark rooms and stained glass and God lived up in the rafter someplace. Uh, and it was uh, 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 a different language and uh, smoke and incense and those kind of things. And there was, uh, there was room for lament in that kind of a service. Uh, then we had uh, the uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God period uh, where God was angry at the world and was punishing us and mm -hmm. that we were sinners being dangled over the depths of hell. And that certainly was lament heavy. Uh, but then in the, I don't know, someplace around the 40s or 50s, we became evangelicals. Uh, and evangelicals, the whole purpose of worship was to evangelize, to get people into the kingdom. In our tradition, get them into the baptistry, okay? Uh, and you didn't want to speak bad about God because nobody would want a God that was angry. Uh, so you, you put God in the best possible uh, light. And, and then we came in the 60s and 70s and 80s to uh, worship as celebration. Praise. Yeah. Praise. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I just, on the way over here, was listening to a radio station that says, totally positive Christian music. <laughs> and uh, certainly lament has no place in a totally positive uh, uh, type of outlook. So 
I, I agree with you. I think we've lost lament. We've lost. What do you think? Well, I, I do. I, I think because if you, if you study, well, you had just, I think last time we met, you had just gotten through reading Lamentations because it's not much, mm -hmm. not long to read. And I think one of the things you become aware is that uh, the, the lament, uh, prayers that had lament in them were about isolation, they were about uh, shame, they were about despair, they were about danger, they were about physical impairment, uh, they were about death. Um, and there were complaints that sometimes to, to God. Mm. I, I think of uh, my, one of my favorite musicals is Fiddler on the Roof. Mm. And you remember that he talked to God in, yeah. his, in his prayers. And so uh, he would often say, God, well, you had a quote. Yeah, the, my favorite quote out of Fiddler on the Roof is, God, I know we're your chosen people, but you have to choose us so often. Yes. <laughs> and, and, but he would come right behind those kinds of things with a praise. Mm. And if you, if you follow the scriptures, the Psalms, uh, many of the Psalms, yes. and, and so forth, they have the lament and then there's the follows with, with praise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, we're very uncomfortable with it. We don't know how to, to say to God, God, I'm really ticked off with you. Yeah. Uh, look what you've done. You've given me this virus, and I didn't want this thing, didn't ask for it. And I prayed that I wouldn't get it, and I still got it. What yeah. are you doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That Those are legitimate ways of speaking to God, reverently. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, they, they give us a, a realness about our relationship. We've almost gotten to the place where Christians can't say that. Yes. That it's a lack of faith. Yes. If you, if you say, uh, God is not speaking to me, or God, why did you let this happen to me? Or uh, it, we almost have to apologize for it. Yes. Okay. But in a way, it does show faith. Because oh, the very fact that we're going to God, realizing that He is the one that's in control. Mm. And, and we so don't we, understand what you're doing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it, there, there's faith and there's relationship. Right. Because the very fact that we are calling out to God. And that, that's the way that these, these lament prayers start. Yes. Very first. God, where are you? You're, you're addressing God. Yes. Yes. yes, and uh, I just uh, spent some time uh, with a, another congregation uh, looking at the, the book of Habakkuk. Yeah, uh, and Habakkuk only, only three chapters. I mean, it's very short, but H Habakkuk uh, challenges God. Yes, ch uh, says, "Why do you make me look at these things? Uh, why do you?" Uh, it's almost as though God is forcing him to see him, but not telling him why it's going on. And uh, in the second chapter, he says, I'm going to stand up on the tower and I'm going to stay there until you give me an answer. Mm. That almost, that sounds unchristian, doesn't it? Mm. It's, it's, yes, but it is a lament prayer. Yes, for sure. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And That's a great illustration. And it's the only way that you can get from where you are to where you ought to be. When you're feeling a lack of guidance, yeah, you know, yeah. You, you need to talk about that. But it's also saying I look to God to, to praise Him. Yeah, because I know He's looking out after me. You know, and they say, Jim, you're my you're my best friend here, but why did you do this to me? You know, and you might say, Well, Bill, I really had in mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Lament prayer is is times when we are grieving, when we are in sorrow, and it's those times when we're in that dark place, and we we don't like to be in that dark place. Yeah, no. And and we don't know which way to turn, and yeah. so we look up. We look up to God. Uh, in the, in Habakkuk again. Uh, Habakkuk says, God, why do you allow injustice to take place? And God answers him and says, uh, I'm going to take care of this by having the Babylonians come in and they're going to sweep in and the righteous and the wicked will both be consumed. And Habakkuk says, no, God, that's the wrong answer. Ah, okay. He says, that can't be right. Why would you allow a wicked, uh, that's more wicked, 
that the, the wicked, righteous, and then why would you allow them to come in? And then God goes on to say, let me tell you what's going to happen. Hmm. Okay? Uh, I, I can really identify with him, can't you? Yeah. It's like I often shake my head and say, Lord, what are you doing? Yeah. 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 But he not only says... Uh, what are you doing? But he later says, nope, that's the wrong, wrong answer. answer. You gave yes. the wrong answer. <laughs> you are a just God. Yeah. You wouldn't allow an unjust people to overcome those that you promised you'd take care of. I know better how you ought to be God than yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jesus, Jesus prayed a prayer of lament as he was hanging on the cross. Yeah. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's I, crying out right. to God. I, I heard somebody recently just say, well, if... Yeah, I don't. This this helps me not believe in God. I said, "What do you mean?" Well, God wouldn't allow such a thing as this virus. It's a really a poor understanding we have of God. Yeah. What was it? Somebody wrote a book many years ago. Phillips could call "Your God is Too Small." Yes. Yes. The the, the title is still true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's Jim. Your quote about Jesus on the cross is interesting. That we say. Yeah, but that was Jesus. Uh, God was doing something there. He shouldn't do that to us. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's interesting that he who was from the first, okay, felt that same desertion by God on yes. the cross. Yes, yes. Wow, that's overwhelming. It, it is. It, it, but, you know, the powerful thing, talking about Easter again, the powerful thing is to realize that with death, there comes also the resurrection. Yeah. And that is the hope. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we are living for well, and with. And, that, and that's the way with laments that they're at the end. There's that hope. Yes. There's and that hope. Not only, okay, uh, with death comes resurrection, but you can't have a resurrection without a death. death. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yes. the death had to take place for the resurrection to take place. Mm -hmm. If the death hadn't taken place, the resurrection couldn't take place. Mm -hmm. I had a professor once who said, um, "Which was the greatest event, the birth or the death of Christ?" And after we future theologians got finished kicking around the ball, he said, the question is irrelevant. <laughs> you can't have the death without the birth, and you can't have the resurrection without the death, that the, the plan of God in its entirety mm. had to take place. Yes. Mm. Yes. Um, one of the final things I'd like to bring up is, says, uh, lament is to express great regret, grief or sorrow through works or actions. If we're saying that it's not my fault, how can I regret? How can I grieve? How can I, how can I lament if I don't first say, I know why uh, this is taking place? It's because I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my first, maybe it sounds like a glib answer, my first response is that is, is that, you, that you can lament that you don't have a reason. Mm -hmm. Your regret is because I don't know why. Uh, and, and that can be part of the lamenting too, is I yeah. just don't know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> I think that it is the fact that God has not made it clear yeah. that God has not spoken. Again, my Habakkuk studies, mm -hmm. you're saying, God, why do you make me see these things? Why do you make me go through these things? And then you don't tell me what you're up to. Yes. Explain mm -hmm. to me. I'm waiting to the other side. I yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you grieve the fact that God hasn't spoken. Mm -hmm. As you say, clearly, do you? Yeah, yes. clearly. Um, and then, <clears throat> then works and actions is the very activity of, of lamenting. Yes. Jim, you have anything else? Well, you mentioned about regret. Mm. And, and I, I think people realize what they've done is wrong, mm. and there is regret involved. 
uh, in the Old Testament, David, when Nathan the prophet came to him and he told him that little story. Mm -hmm. And then David realized what he had done. And he said, I have sinned, I have sinned. There was regret in, in David. Uh, you know, Again, some, without without regret, there's no forgiveness. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, some people, some people, they don't regret what they've done. But there, there are other others who realize what they have done, and you know, Peter, Peter, on that night, yeah, yeah, when he realized what he had done, yeah. he he had, uh, you know, denied Christ. Yeah. And he wept bitterly. There was regret, regret in Peter. Yeah. And two, I think uh, this is not the last chapter in the book, okay? No. This is the first chapter in the book. Lamenting, seeking God, seeking God's face, letting God speak is where we start. Grieving with those who grieve <clears throat> is not where we finish. Yes. No. But it's where we begin our journey. Yeah, right. Anything else, Bill? No, I think no. we're a good place right here. Yeah, okay. I, agree. I agree. Then uh, we'll uh, see you when we come back next time. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>